Well, good morning. Here we are again uh, for another Sunday to dive into the Bible, see what it has to say for us, for our lives. And um, it's Palm Sunday, uh, and we're beginning what's known to many churches. Uh, it's called Holy Week. So it's certainly one interesting and uh, memorable uh, Palm Sunday as we are not singing as a gathered church and um you know, we're not singing songs like Hosanna, uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, you might be doing that, but you're probably doing it right in the comfort of your home if you are. But um, we're right in the middle uh, of, of this situation that we find ourselves in. And instead of uh, coming together and gathering in churches, we're just huddling with family. So we're on a road to resurrection, Easter which is next Sunday, is also called Resurrection Sunday. And it's, it's the day that we celebrate uh, Jesus coming back to life after dying on the cross and being buried in the tomb. And uh, so we're working our way up to that. And like I said, it's known as Holy Week. Well, this morning we're going to spend our time in John chapter 12. And... Uh, this is a fantastic passage uh, where, like I said, we're focusing on Palm Sunday. And you'll see why it's called Palm Sunday here in a moment if you're not familiar with that term. But uh, we're going to dive into John chapter 12. And we're looking at uh, a big chunk of it. So, I mean, we're going to be reading quite a bit, but it's very important that we do that in order to capture the context of what is taking place. So we're reading John chapter 12, verses one through 26. If you have a Bible and you wanna turn there yourself, feel free to do that. And uh, I'm gonna start though with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible that we can trust it, that we can uh, order our lives around what it says, that it is relevant for our lives today, that it's true. We believe, Lord, that it is for us so that we can read it and we can be equipped to walk this life um, in just abundance and uh, just in victory along with you, Lord. So thank you for the Bible. Thank you for this time to read it and to discern what it has to say to us and thank you, Lord, just for these thoughts that you put on my heart to share with everyone who is tuned in right now. So, Lord, we give you praise and glory, and we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. So John chapter 12, verses 1 through 26 says this. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus has, had raised from the dead. So they gave him uh, gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of exp uh, expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. 
His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they'd heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. And that's the end of our scripture reading. So Jesus, he made this grand entry into Jerusalem. Other parallel passages mention how they took their their cloaks and spread them out uh, on the road as as well as these leafy branches. And in John uh, chapter 12, verse 13, it says that they proclaimed him a king. Uh, Can you imagine? I mean, this was Roman occupied Jerusalem. And where, this is where Caesar was king, right? And here they are proclaiming Jesus as king. So it was the Jewish Passover. And Jerusalem was buzzing with traffic and energy. I mean, it was a busy city at that time. So Greeks that were there asked the apostle Philip to see Jesus. And Jesus makes some pretty powerful statements here. I don't know if you caught those. He said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So it was time for Jesus to endure this horrid path uh, to his fake trial, his scourging, and then the cross. So if you notice in verses 24 and 25, it said this. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So our American culture has been so focused on self, hasn't it? I fight for what I want. I fight for my rights, and somehow my, my rights get, get a little twisted and, and the lines get blurred between my rights and my wants, don't they? Yes, the grain of wheat falls to the earth, dies, and then it grows. And Jesus explained that whoever loves his life loses it. If you love your life, you'll lose it. If you hate your life, you'll keep it for eternal life. What does this mean? I mean, those are some words that might be a little bit confusing to you. And and maybe that just doesn't make sense. Maybe you think it should be like the opposite of that. The Apostle Paul, he wrote, you foolish person. And this is in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 36. He says, you foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. We're in the middle of this fight for survival as many, many are unemployed and and many are trying to avoid or to beat COVID-19. And and on the lighter side, of course, some folks are still attempting to buy toilet paper from the store, right? And uh, and hand sanitizer as well. Uh, Some of you might have experienced some rude or just downright mean people at the stores lately. Um, There's a fight to survive right now, isn't there? There's this tremendous focus on self 
and self-preservation at whatever cost, right? Whatever it takes. Have you noticed also, though, this enormous focus in our culture on entertainment lately? And this isn't just, you know, this is obviously way before this chapter that we're dealing with this, this stay-at-home order that we have. But this, this focus on entertainment, I mean, how can you miss it? Um, Americans are attempting to get the most entertainment for their buck. You know, what's the best streaming package? Uh, what's the cheapest method to, to get Disney tickets? Uh, what's the latest and greatest Netflix series or the newest and most advanced VR game? Um, how can I improve my living room and make it more into this theater, this entertainment center? Um, what's the latest TV graphics technology? And so on and so forth, just consumed and, and just absorbed into entertaining ourselves and, and just at whatever, you know, we, we try and try hard to entertain ourselves. We consume and we want more. Jesus said, whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. No, Jesus is not talking about hating your life in a way that it is self-destructive. He would never uh, never be implying that uh, because, because Jesus loves life. He's the life giver. Um, no, uh, he is attempting to help us see that we are to take ourselves off the throne of our lives and to put him there. He's trying to help us see that we have to come off the throne and put him there on that throne. The Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, he said, But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. So Paul was writing to people who followed Jesus and were bombarded with Jewish thoughts and traditions, okay? And one of those was circumcision. Uh, there were many back then who wanted to follow Jesus, but they wanted to keep every single part of the Jewish law, all right? And so they took great pride in following the Jewish law. And, and Paul makes it clear Far be it from him that he would boast or brag in, in anything except the cross of Jesus. Some Bible translations say, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross. God forbid that I would do boast in anything except for the cross of Jesus. He was focused not on himself, not on religious tradition, but on Jesus' death on the cross, and he said, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So his interest in the world had been crucified. And Paul also knew that the world wouldn't be that interested in him anymore either, because he was so sold out for, for Jesus. What is one of the first words that a two-year-old learns? Mine, isn't it? Mine. Um, you try to take the toys away from that two-year-old. You try to take, uh, you know, it's it's great watching two toddlers playing together, isn't it? As, as somebody's playing with this and the other one goes right over and just grabs it and starts walking off with it. I mean, mine. It's it's not something we need to be taught. It's very natural, this, this selfishness. Uh, that starts at such a young, young age. Self-preservation, self-satisfaction, self-entertainment, self-gain. How do we get over all of this? How do we get over it? Die to self and live for Christ. Die to self and live for Christ. Romans 6, 6 says, 
For we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So I identify with Jesus dying on the cross for the sins of the world in such a way that I died with him. Um, No, not literally, obviously, but figuratively and spiritually, yes, I have. This took place when I put my faith in Jesus, and and I believe that he is the Savior. He is the Savior alone. And, And he died on the cross for sin and rose from the dead on the third day. I'm convinced that many people during this season of quarantine or the stay-at-home order will be asking questions and seeking for things that really, truly matter in life. They will be searching for purpose during this chapter, during this season. So in Matthew's Gospel, during Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, It says in chapter 21, verse 10, And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? Maybe you're listening to this message and you're asking that question. Who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? Can he really make a difference in my life? Um, In order for you and for for me to discover the abundant life that is found in a relationship with Jesus, you and I must be willing to put him on the throne of our lives. We put him on the throne of our lives. You, You understand what that means? It means putting him in charge. It means submitting to him, coming under his authority. That means that you must die to self. Again, let me remind you again of those verses in John 12, verses 24 and 25. These are our key verses we're focusing on this morning. And these are key verses that I I really want you all to to take some time to study and, and meditate on them. Uh, maybe look them up in different translations to get a better, you know, a better feel for for the the original intent of, of the author here. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Do you think that dying to self sounds a bit morbid? Does it appear to be a little extreme? Maybe it even comes across as a a defeat or a powerless act. On the contrary, when you die to self and put Jesus Christ on the throne of your life, you become victorious. You experience abundance when when you do that. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's this amazing exchange that takes place. I give up my life and Jesus comes to live in me. I give up my life and Jesus comes to live in me. In chapter 19 of Luke's gospel in the Bible is where you find his account of Jesus entering Jerusalem. And in Luke 19, verses 41 and 42, it says, And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, meaning Jesus. He wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. 
but now they are hidden from your eyes. Would you agree with me that many folks are attempting to find peace here and there? I mean, they're just searching, searching so many places to find peace. Uh, Jesus, in his own um, in his own words here, he just had such a burden. Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes. I mean, have you heard how the alcohol sales are just, have they greatly increased during the stay-at-home order? People are trying to cope. People are trying to find something to give them some peace and some, some, some calmness. Uh, and we, we know alcohol does that. Uh, and, and yet Jesus says, would that you even you had known on this day the things that make for peace. I feel like that's a message for us right now. And Jesus grieved, it said, didn't it? He wept over Jerusalem. He wanted them to know true peace. And Jesus, in his own meek but authoritative way, he knew that he was the answer. He was the answer. And that many folks there would not understand his upcoming death there in Jerusalem. They would not put their faith in him. <clears throat> Matter of fact, many, most would mock him. <clears throat> so how about you? How about you? Are you sick and tired of trying things on your own? Are you ready to lose your life and yet find the most fulfilling, abundant life that exists? Then you will be, uh, then, then you will have to be, in order to do that, you will have to be willing to stop trying to do it on your own. You will have to be willing to put Jesus on the throne of your life. And the thing about putting Jesus on the throne of your life, that is never a decision that you would regret. Putting Jesus on the throne of your life is always a decision that brings you joy and peace for the rest of your life and, and just abundance. No, it doesn't mean my checking account's huge and it doesn't mean I drive the latest, greatest, fanciest car. It doesn't mean I never get sick. It doesn't mean my loved ones don't die, but I have a Savior who walks with me through all these ups and downs in life. I'm not alone. And I feel like Jesus is calling out to, to the world right now as the world is dealing with this issue. He's calling out to the world, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. Jesus is his name. He's the one who brings peace. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the scriptures. We're so thankful, Lord, that they provide for us all we need. They build us up in our faith. They give us opportunity to have just faith for the very first time in you. Lord, I pray for all those who are listening to this message that if they're looking for peace elsewhere, that they would come to you, Jesus. They would come to you. They would be willing to die to self and live for you, to put you on the throne of their lives, Lord. Would you do that in their hearts? And I pray that people would uh, just be willing to lower themselves and to humble themselves and be willing to do that. Now, Lord, we just trust you with the future this future that we don't know, we don't know what it holds. But we know you're there. Oh, you're already there, Jesus. You're already there, God. And, and we don't have to worry and wonder and fret, but Lord, we can have peace. Even though um, things are interrupted terribly in our lives right now, Lord, we can trust you because you're on the throne of our lives. So Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to to open up the scriptures and to find you in all of this and to find what it means to die to self so that you can be in charge, providing us all that we need through this. 
Thank you, Lord. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.